Hello there. The fact is that Gurdjieff grew up in a very unusual way, working on many different trades. If you know the story, his father made him do this because his father had lost lots of money and was forced to change businesses, and so he didn't want the same thing to happen to his son. So Gurdjieff was forced to do all sorts of different kinds of work that made him free-centred or be vital from a very young age. There isn't really another way of doing that except to do what Gurdjieff did. Anyway, if you're interested in his teachings, you have to become like that. And whatever is around you, especially if it's difficult, you should undertake it. Especially if no one's ever instructed you. Once somebody's instructed you and you copy their instructions, it has almost no value in terms of Gurdjieff work. Now consider this, you know, in the pandemic, the entire world government, the best money, the best minds, everything was pushed towards these injections and they failed and they failed terribly. They failed in the time of crisis. This should tell you that the entire world culture is useless. You're probably better off asking a cab driver because at least he knows something. You've got to understand that the way people talk to each other just doesn't mean anything. And today, as the Western world, the whole world really is collapsing, somebody has pulled the plug of the bath. Either that, or you could say somebody's filling up the bath with so much bullshit that it's just washing everything away. It is the deluge, isn't it? That's what we're living through. But like I said a few weeks ago, as since ancient times it has been realized that humanity on this planet lives through four yugas, the fact that it's four means that we're doomed anyway. Because if it's not five, it's not spiritualized. Any planet that lives through cycles of four yugas is at a level too low to reach the other side. Such is the world we live in. I was in church on Sunday, and I noticed two things that I'll share with you. The first is this question about why Jesus died for our sins. And you can hear umpteen thin explanations as to what this really means. Well, it refers to a certain stage in the development of the octave. So it can't really be understood unless you appreciate the octave. As you may have noticed, there are seven days in a week. It's five, and then there's two, right? And actually, if you're sensitive, you recognize that Mondays have a certain energy, Wednesdays have a certain energy, etc. So whether you like it or not, you're already inside an octave for the regulation of the week in our society. In other words, somebody in the ancient past knew what the fuck they would do. such a strange world we live in, isn't it? It's like waking up out of some strange dream. To find that there is a kind of cosmic order of an unexpected character. It's almost unimaginable to modern people that they would have to know any of these kinds of things because they're all free. Right? They're all free, meaning they have no fucking idea what they're doing. It's unimaginable, I think, that you would have to understand any of this shit, isn't it? The octave? A living sun? Surely you're joking. The world of myth, for instance of Pegasus or Icarus, those were stories that referred to actually our inner development. They're describing something that's happening inside of them. But people don't talk like that anymore because nothing is happening inside of them. The entire intelligence of people these days is simply directed externally into the wrong work of a dying world. The stories aren't just feelings, they are, they are the unfolding of the spirit within you. Now, the second thing I noticed is that after I take the Eucharist, 
I sit down. And sometimes they sing a hymn, but I don't sing. I don't want to interrupt the process of digestion. And what, by the way, is the relationship between breathing exercises and digestion? Digestion is a critically important part of any spiritual work. There are two things that are missing from most spiritual practices that exist on the earth today. The first is that although the practice may create something, going into what is created and making it part of you is usually missing. The second thing that is usually missing universally is the sense of digesting things that are created. And of course, the third thing, need I say it, is that people have not the slightest idea what it is that they are doing. They do sometimes still do things, and even sometimes with instructions or diagrams and things, but they don't really understand. But if you were to correct those two things, you would be going a long way. Now I've got um, I've got something unusual today. Uh, before I read out Gurdjieff and Catherine Hume, I'm going to read out a little bit of Anglo-Saxon ancient history, and this comes from I think it's called Bede's Ecclesiastical History of Britain. It says Oswald was the brother of Ianfrid. And was a very earnest Christian. He determined to attack Kudwala in the year 635 and collected an army at a spot not far from Hexham and the Roman Wall, called by the English Heffenfeld. When all was ready, he had a large wooden cross made and set up, supporting it with his own hands while the earth was being thrown into the hole in which it was fixed and he and all his army knelt and prayed for success. Kidwala was routed and slain, and Oswald became king. Not unnaturally, the cross was endowed by the people with miraculous power. Bede tells us that in his time small chips of wood were cut from it and steeped in water, and the water thus hallowed cured both man and beast. That's from an ancient time, seldom remembered. But the truth is, I was thinking, it is those inner things in people that I'm interested in. I'm not interested in the words, or anything that they talk about today, but more like the myths that they carry. That's where they really are. And that's really what is interesting. Okay, I'm going to read a little bit of Catherine Hume with Gurdjieff, who I like very much. The Christmas of 1936 was the only one I was ever to spend with Gurdjieff. A celebration that made all subsequent ones seem lustreless and routine. I gathered impressions that holiday season as if I knew it was to be a once-in-a-lifetime experience in which Gurdjieff seemed to have invented Christmas. In the preceding days, I acted as his chauffeur, for he had developed a bad infection in his right thumb, which for a time prevented his driving with a swollen, bandaged hand. The first time I went to the cafe to offer my services, he refused me, but the second time he accepted, grumbling about getting around Paris in a taxi driven by an idiot who knew only three places. Etoile, Opera, and Montmartre. When I drive my own car, he said, I can always go directly where I wish, finding even the smallest streets. You will like the American Indian for direction, I said. Our redskins could go through the forest reading signs no white man could see. Not for forest am I specialist, Gurdjieff replied, but for sand. Never can I get lost in desert. You know 
How to travel in the desert depends from two secrets which pass from father to son, a legomenism. One I can tell. For example, always big ridges lie a certain way in relation to the wind. Before you start to cross, look how these dunes lie. If they lie across your path, then always you must keep them traverse with the sun over the shoulder and making slight changes for the changing sun. These great dunes never change for an ordinary small storm. Only a big storm can move them and make them different. This, you see, is very important to know because once you are 50 meters from the starting point, there is no right, no left. Just as in his work, I thought. Was that why he told the simple piece of desert law which any Saharan traveller knew? I drove him that day to Heliard, the famous spice shop behind the Madeleine, where he purchased the rare spices and out-of-season fruits which at his table he vaunted as having been sent to him from the planet Caritas. On Christmas morning I reported to his apartment at 8.30 to see if he still needed me, and drove him to the Café de la Pie for breakfast. I watched him select from the kitchen cooler a large piece of cheese, wrap it and thrust it in his pocket. Then we were off. In the cafe he ordered butter for me. You, being American, have a habit for butter. And in truth it is a very good thing with the cheese. I do not order for self only because I have no such habit. We ate in silence, then he pushed back his breakfast plate and said, And now we can service nature again. You know, crocodile, this is what food is for, for servicing nature. In truth we are slaves, such poor slaves. Nature does not give this food. All his life man must work for it, and when he eats it is not for him, but for servicing nature. Nature gives only one thing, he gives atmosphere, this air, this is all he gives, for all the rest man must work his whole lifetime. He looked at me with a grin, only air, and that old idiot who created such, he swaggers now, imagine, swaggering for having created such an absurdity. I knew better than to interrupt with a pointed query about the breathing exercise he had given us, aimed precisely to take from that absurd air the being food it contained, as conscious man had done since the beginning of conscious time. I sat like a yogi doing the breathing exercises whilst he tried to bluff me out of my belief that an instructed man could take more from air than the oxygen the lungs required. The master was in a most genial mood. She began chattering about the big news of that day. The first Christmas, the Dion quintuplets were allowed to spend with their family. I saw Gurdjieff's puzzled expression and explained, Before this, the quintuplets were kept apart, Mr. Gurdjieff. Scientists wish to study them. They think some valuable scientific elucidation might result. Study? Gurdjieff mocked. How can they study when scientists come from the same barrel? Such non-entity, all of it. With such thing as five from the same birth, there can be nothing to study. Five take what was meant for one. No individuality can be there. He talked about the money the parents had made. In his Russian newspaper, he had read the arrangements. Now, many people are jealous because these parents are rich, and many people try for the same thing. But if people understood what this really means... Then they would cry. Now man begins to breed like mice. Never before in history was such thing as this. Four, five at a time. Twins even were a rare thing. Soon now five will not be notable. People will speak only about six, then of seven. Nobody sees what this means. Quantity destroying quality. He dismissed with an angry wave of the hand the stupidity of that day's headline, the stupidity of the outer world of man. The next part of the story is very famous, 
Gurdjieff hands out beautiful boxes of presents to everybody in his flat. But we catch them again afterwards. We reach the Sans Souci before him. The cafe was filled with platinum blonde chorus girls still in heavy makeup, relaxing after their midnight stints in nearby boites. A few minutes before one o'clock, Gurdjieff looked in the door to make sure we were there. Over the heads of the blonde chlorines, his black eyes, black moustache, black astrakhan cap and fur-collared greatcoat looked twice black. Every eye in the cafe was on him as he walked towards us like a dark sultan showing pleasure because we had managed to capture and keep a corner table for him. Nobody but ourselves knew or could even have remotely imagined that he had been up since dawn of the previous morning. He sat down among us with a deep sigh. Another Shvalok year is ended. I would say that today the level of humanity has declined even further. Instead of five children, they have one of each colour to impress their friends. That's all family means these days, isn't it? Well, at least in some quarters. God gives strength to those who are trying to resist all that. I'll finish with some excerpts from an essay by Julius Evola on the inversion of symbols. He says, Before anything, let us take the colour red. This colour which has become the emblem of subversion has recurring connection with the regal and imperial function, connection not unrelated to the sacred character recognised in it. The tradition can carry us as far back as classical antiquity, with this colour in its correspondence with fire, conceived as the highest of all the elements, that which according to the ancients was the substance of the highest heaven for which this heaven can be called Empyrean. In the Roman rite of triumph, whose character was more religious than military, the emperor originally dyed himself in the same colour, so as to represent love, the king of the gods, who was thought to have acted through the emperor's person, and thus to be the true artificer of the victory. Or let us take the very word revolution. Few are aware of the perversion of the word's proper original sense in its modern usage. Revolution in the primary sense does not mean subversion and revolt, but really even the opposite, that is, return to a point of departure and ordinary motion around a centre, for which in astronomical language the revolution of a star is precisely the movement it accomplishes in gravitating around a centre. And of course the ultimate inverted symbol is the rainbow, which, in the time of Isaac Newton, was a wonderful symbol of the ascending octave and the unification of all things through stratas into the white light, where today it means the dismemberment of ancient cultures and depravity inconceivable to previous eras, very much assisted by the insanity of the internet and mobile phones. For instance, today I noticed that if you type in something into the search bar of your browser, you don't actually get what you want. You get a lecture about the temperature at which you should wash your clothes so that you can save the carbon or something. Or the wonders of electric cars that are made of this carbon fibre that actually takes five million years to break down and is far worse than the steel that cars used to be made of. I was watching something on a popular video streaming website the other day. I switched it on and immediately this massive black face jumped out at me. This shock, this reversing of what you expected is a parasitism of your own functions because these technologies simply enter inside of you and rip you to shreds. Such evil afoot, all stemming I'm afraid, from a country that was always planted in mid-air and is now 
suffering the consequences of being phony from the beginning. Let us hope it sinks before it takes the whole world down with it. Amen. <laughs>